My name is Melina Villeneuve, and I am extremely proud to welcome you to this panel tonight, um, or today, depending on where you're from. I am the co-founder and research director of Demilitarized Education, or DEDUCATION, and I'm on the UK board of the US-based organization Women of Color Advancing Peace and Security. Basically, like everyone present on tonight's panel, I work in security-ish. On the one hand, there's DED that seeks to dismantle the links that exists between the global arms trade, militarism, and universities. And on the other hand, I do the communications for an organization whose sole purpose is to put women of color at the forefront of security policy and conflict transformation. Um, again, I am beyond grateful to be here this evening. Um, and tomorrow I'll be on a panel about demilitarizing education. So make sure to come to that one. Um, but I think now we can go ahead and get started with this uh, opening panel. It's been 10 years now since we witnessed the Arab uprisings, and it's almost been a year uh, that we've renewed the conversations on this side of the world regarding the injustices we face as communities of colors, of color in white dominated societies and spaces. We've seen an increase in militarized police structures and systems, resulting in peaceful protests ending in violent ways. And yet we never stop fighting. The title of this talk is a nod to Maya Angelou's And Still I Rise, because although the road to justice is not easy, we won't stop until we are all safe from the harms of war. These methods of oppression we face are international, okay, and they are spread by the continuous growth of the global arms trade. How can we put our efforts together and effectively mobilize ourselves to counter the waves of oppression that we face? by standing in solidarity with our brothers and sisters across the globe. No matter where in the world they exist, these systems are working against us because they know that by dividing us, they can keep an upper hand on us. But one thing has changed in how we are able to communicate and advocate for our rights and our freedom, the use of social media. Social media has had its moments, you know, good and bad. Um, but part of the reason why the initial protests in Tunisia sparked more uprisings in neighboring countries was due to the widespread use of social media. And thus, in the last decade, we've had access to footage and an insight on conversations we wouldn't have otherwise. And with BLM protests over the summer of 2020 being broadcast on various social media platforms, we were able to stand in solidarity with one another throughout it all. Plus, let's not forget about the hashtag and SARS movement for which many um, from all walks of life congregated on the internet to shine a light on the barbaric methods of dispersal um, that the Nigerian police had and, and was using. So what lessons have we learned in the last decade when it comes to creating tangible and durable changes in our society following massive uprisings and calls for justice? Are there lessons to learn from or should we focus on the particularity of a situation in order to resolve it rather than trying to apply existing strategies from other contexts? I unfortunately don't have the answers, <laughs> but the hope is that by democratizing our societies and removing the colonial undertones of our geopolitics, we can also address the massive elephant in the room that is essentially the reason why these tensions continue to exist and at times escalate past the point of no returns, the global arms trade. Enough about me <laughs> and what I have to say. Um, tonight's opening panel talk will shed a light on the similarities that exist between our fights for justice and the importance of supporting one another. We will be hearing from an incredible panel of four individuals, um, Mariam Barguti, Adam Moussa, Pascal Péan, and starting with Syed Awadi, who is the Director of Advocacy at the UK-based Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy, also known as Bird, B-I-R-D. Um, so, yeah, Said, whenever you are ready, you can take it away. <laughs> hi, hi. It's, it's such a great honor to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's always a privilege to do any activities with CAT. We do it with full enjoyment. And that's, that's what I really love about it. So what I wanted to say here is I wanted to say is that I have been through this experience of the Arab Spring. It was a dream which became true in the streets in Bahrain, Manama. I, and I do recall those memories. It's been 10 years, 10 years past, and I still remember these moments as they are so much fresh in my mind because they also like changed my mind, changed, changed my life forever. So it was 
a moment where the Bahrainis, uh, a state which is a country, a very small island within the Gulf region, we known to be the neighbor of Saudi Arabia. The only connection of this island is there is a bridge between Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, and that's the only way people could get out of the country if they if if they choosing a car. So it's we known like the people within the Gulf, they known that they live under brutal dictatorship and these dictators came into a challenge for the first time in Bahrain. Bahrain, when it comes into the scale of the movement, it was unprecedented in the entire Arab world, but because we're a small nation. So talking about figures within the New York Times, they, they spoke about 100,000. 100,000 in a population which do not exceed 600,000, it's it's a massive number. And if, if, if all of them, they, of the, the entire population is in the street demanding democracy, demanding change, it was such a powerful message. It couldn't be any stronger. Like they have, and I think in some cases, if you have your one third of your entire population is on the street, is a massive figure that you probably would not see. And if we were in the size of Egypt, imagine how many millions that would be on the, in, on the street. The, the reason is for this fight is not about people fighting for a bread or people fighting for they fighting for dignity they fighting because they had enough of uh, uh, of a dictatorship of superpower dictating our fate militarization all of these issues were really the heart of the subject so if you ask me about what was the march of a dream it was this march of a dream was when people from a graveyard, they walk to the iconic place, which is the roundabout. The government thought that by using violence against people and, and opening fire against their own people, that they will, they will terrify the public. They will, everyone will get scared. What happens in Bahrain is give a counter uh, effect, and that counter effect, it just fire back. And it just caused a, a real reason for people to be together and to march together and that was a march of unity march where you can say whatever is in your in your mind in a dictatorship in a brutal policing you say this is the first time where we stay down with the dictators down with al khalifa down with the king down with the prime minister it was a dream becoming true because this is where you feel the freedom of speech is in action and no one can stop us because it's all the people came together all of them to have one unified message. Enough is enough. No more dictatorship. It's time for people to have their say. It's time for people uh, to take control of their own future. And that's where we uh, landed to the far roundabout. And it was a beautiful moment. When people take these actions, then the government responded and the response was violent. They, they crashed the demonstrators. And I remember those moments when I saw protesters after the protest will collect the tear gas canisters. They will make like they use uh, like a supermarket trolley to collect them all and they just pull them together. And I went just to close to them. What just struck me still is I saw on the uh, tear gas canisters, it's written made in USA. And it was others of them were made in the UK. This is triggered in my mind to this day is just because when the repression starts, it's not only those abusive dictators who did this to us, it was also those who enabled them, who provided them with the arms, with the means in order to be able to repress us. And I, I, I wanted to say like it's been 10 years, but throughout this, I learned so many lessons and those lessons could have direct impact. And I, I am a believer in direct action and I think a lot of what really inspired me to, to do this is, is by having a friend and colleagues from CAT. I've seen it in action and I love it. It's it just like, uh, it's, it's something, uh, sometimes it, it would be the only means. And I remember once, and this was to provide details, it was on the 26th of October, 2016. A journalist told me that the King of Bahrain is meeting with Theresa May. At that time, Theresa May was the prime minister. And I thought this is an, a golden opportunity to send and deliver a message to the dictator in the country. And I, along with other activists, as his motor vehicle, about to enter Tindarning Street, I literally throw myself, my body on his car, 
and my my friend just like banged on his window. I don't know if he was on the side on that side or not. And uh, then as he went to three semi to shake hand outside till down in the street, we were screaming down why are you hosting dictators why are you hosting torturers as the police dragging me to the police van i felt like it was an embarrassment moment for a dictator that he thought he will be coming to get a photo op with the british prime minister that was disrupted completely ruined up and it gave me i said well, if I spend my day in a prison cell today in the UK, I would I would be doing it with a big smile on my face because I just literally ruined up like the PR opportunity for the king, for the dictator in the country uh, of or, uh, who is behind all these problems in the country. That moment, unfortunately, uh, well, the police just stopped me. It was a direct action. They let me go, and I went home thinking everything is normal. This is then on the same night, my wife and my infant son were about to uh, to return back to London. They were on a short holiday in the country. And this is where the abuse, the security, they took it on them. They took it on the child. They took it on my wife to abuse them, to, to send them a message that they will not tolerate such action. So I'm saying is actions, solidarity actions, does matter. And it does upset dictators so much. They hate it. They don't like it. They don't like people uh, from countries where they would like to meet with the with government, and then the people or either individuals in exile or solidarity individuals which has sympathizes with the causes. When they send this strong message, it's it's extremely powerful, and the dictators will feel it. And I think if it wasn't this, then uh, like they wouldn't take direct action against my own family reprises on this basis. I wanted to. To end this by giving you a very solid, very strong solidarity message, I learned from it very recently, just about a few weeks ago, and it was a, during the 10th anniversary of the uprising. The regime this time thought the revolution is not over, so they came after children. Children as young as 11 years old were arrested because of role of anti-protest against the government. These children were two years old when the uprising started in 2011. I spoke to two children, which were 13. One child told me during the interrogation without his lawyer, he was asked about whether he took part in the protest. He said, they pressed me so much, so I thought I should tell them that I did this. And he told them that. So he has another friend, another his friend is 13 years old, on the other side, the prosecutor attempted to tell him, oh, you have to confess. He said, no, I didn't do it. They showed him photos, no way, I'm not, I didn't. So he resisted, he didn't want to tell them. And then before the judge, then they took them to a judge to, to decide whether they would be detained or not. So his friend told him, look, I confess to the charges. So if I say yes, you have to say yes too. So when the judge asked them, the child, the first child said, yes, I did it. And then when he asked the second child who refused to tell the prosecutors, I did it. He said, yes, I did it. I said, why did you do this? You didn't confess. They have no evidence against you. Why did you tell this to the judge? He said, it's because of my friend. I don't want him to go to the cell alone. So I want to support him. He's my friend. I don't want to leave him. I don't want to go home without him. That's a lesson. I got it from a 13 years old boy. It's just was so powerful and this shows it tells you so much about solidarity and i think this is i wanted to end my my remarks at this point thank you so much for having me and i mean i'm so much grateful i'm also very hopeful to see the new generation is pretty much seems to be quite awesome so yeah. thank you no i mean thank you like that was so so many things to unpack in that in those nine minutes that you spoke, but I think the point you know of, that you mentioned of dictators not um, liking to be called out is entirely true because you know when I was doing my little research before this happened, um, I was like before today I, I I was just kind of shocked at like how quickly all of these authoritarian leaders were backing down after people were hitting the streets, but then again. That's the point of direct action to make sure that like we are at the forefront of the action and getting things done but thank you thank you so much Said. um and yeah sending you lots of um 
love and wonderfulness. Uh, next up, we have Adam Musaf, who uh, is calling us from London, I believe. Um, and he is a political organizer working with various movements in the UK and also a peace studies student. Um, so Adam, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, um, yeah, so first of all, I just to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak with you here today. I'm really happy to be here. My name's Adam, as was said, and I'm a political activist and organizer based in the UK. Um, I'm the former Black Students Officer for the National Union of Students, and that's how I kind of have been organizing with students for the most part of the previous decade. Um, so with that out of the way, I'm super uh, happy and pleased to be with you here today to discuss and draw out um, linkages between two significant moments in recent memory and um, the mass movements that emerged from them. Um, I think it's super important to highlight as well that we're gathered after the events of the previous week, the crime bill and the ongoing shift towards authoritarianism that we've been uh, seeing. Um, and it's also important to highlight exactly where it is that this finds its roots. The Tory government's been chipping away at our right to protest uh, for the past decade, um, using racism to push through uh, repressive legislation, like in the case of the Counterterrorism and Security Act, so that's the uh, sort of strategy around countering violent extremism, countering violent extremism, extremism, so to speak, um, and that was rushed through uh, all of the respective stages before receiving royal assent. Um, and in the case of earlier this week, they forced through this bill using the pandemic as a perfect cover. So they're not uh, shy to uh, make use of crises to push through their agenda uh, in uh, anti-democratic means, uh, using anti-democratic means to do so. Um, but despite this, it's worth also noting that while the state continues to utilize new tools to repress movements and campaigns um, from below, those very same movements are inventively finding new ways to resist. Um, so I've, I'm joining you here today to kind of like highlight a particular aspect of today's panel. Um, and for me, that aspect is uh, solidarity among and between uh, black people and uh, Palestinians. Um, Nelson Mandela, taught me that my freedom is incomplete without the freedom of the Palestinians and that black liberation cannot be separated from uh, Palestinian liberation. Because when I see them, I see us, to uh, quote a famous video, the viral one, for those of you who've seen it. Um, there, are not many, there are not only many parallels in our oppression, but each one is a reason for us to connect our struggles. And this is what I want to talk about um, in terms of uh, solidarity. Now, these, every single one of these reasons uh, every single one is becomes a reason for us to connect our struggles. And it goes both ways. So when we look to uh, the Black Lives Matter uprisings that happened, Palestinians on Twitter were the first, among the first to provide international support for those protesters in Ferguson. And St. Louis based Palestinians were giving physical support on the ground uh, to uh, frontline uh, demonstrators. Um, from harassment to being beaten, dehumanized and sometimes killed, stop and search, administrative detention, youth incarceration, these are only some of what we share. And of course, it's important to respect the uniqueness of our struggles and our varied histories, but there's a lot of things that people uh, on both sides of this conversation kind of share, from bombs dropped on Palestinian families and their children in their sleep, to the violence of checkpoints that prevents ordinary Palestinians from going about their daily lives. Uh, apartheid laws that systematically disenfranchise and deny dignity to Palestinians living in Israel, um, and of course the occupation. So these are all um, things that are tied and rooted in colonialism, which does not only affect Palestinians, it affects us all, um, and especially black people. This is a global system uh, of racism, the same global system of racism that allows for Mark Duggan to be killed by police on the streets of London with no justice, or Mike Brown in the streets of Ferguson. Same racism that killed Sarah Reed in Holloway prison and incarcerates Palestinian children en masse in prisons over there. And that's why we need to say no to all forms of oppression in our cities or on Palestine streets. Among all of this, however, there is still hope um, because as long as there are people like you and I, people like us who are ready to call out oppression and oppose it, there is hope. And the BDS movement is an example of this following over half a century of occupation and brutalization, ethnic, ethnic cleansing and uh, over-policing by the state of Israel. Uh, Palestinian people have uh, been challenging this throughout, of course, but they've created enough space uh, to reassert 
their own tactics for liberation and we must support them as the international community. So Palestinian civil society has made a call for a campaign of sustained boycott, divestment and sanctions against Israel as an effective method for the international community to show its solidarity. And it's been super effective, guys. Um, uh, I could talk about some of the wins um, and I could be here all day, I kind of want to leave some time as well for uh, conversation. But when I think about some of the recent wins um, of BDS in the UK, I think quite often of uh, French environmental service company and BDS target Violia, who was forced into uh, selling off their business in the occupied Palestinian territories due, due to mass losses incurred by BDS action. Coming back though to the Arab uprising, um, just to share a quick story and I kind of will uh, try to close on this. Uh, just over 10 years ago, I recall being a sixth form student in college, attending um, one of the regular organizing meetings that were happening for the anti-fees mobilizations back in 2010-11 days. And I vividly remember there was this like communique that was read out um, from one of the trade unions that were at the forefront of the revolts we were witnessing in the Arab world at the time. This trade union was in Egypt, so they were involved in the mobilizations in Tahrir Square. Um, and they said to us that, our, organization, our organizing was a source of inspiration for them. Um, they gave us words of encouragement to continue our resistance from within the belly of the beast. Um, and this dialogue, when I think back to it, that occurred, uh, it's the moment I remember fondly and love to speak about. It's one that I refer to whenever I think about what solidarity and practice means, because it showed me that you know, these people were in the midst of a revolution and then they were speaking to students who were campaigning against the tripling of tuition fees, something that you might think is so it does not even compare, right, one to the other. But it showed me that solidarity isn't a transaction, right? Solidarity isn't extending support with the expectation of reci uh, reciprocation. Um, solidarity is, however, about seeing the ways in which our survival and freedom are intimately bound up with one another. Um, and I'll uh, end on this one quote um, that James Baldwin wrote. He ended on this uh, in his introduction to uh, 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 sorry, it, it, an open letter that he wrote to Angela Davis when she was arrested, um, uh, when she was third on the list of 10 most wanted fugitives and what have you in the American state were helping on lynching her. He wrote, um, if I can just get this quote up, um, he wrote uh, in that open letter, he kind of ended by saying, if we know, then we must fight for your life as though it were our own, which it is, and render impossible with our bodies the corridor to the, to the gas chamber. For if they take you in the morning, they will be coming for us that night. Um, and that sentiment, right? That knowing that the same tools that the state uses to oppress you might tomorrow be used to oppress me. And knowing that our freedoms and our liberation is not just something that you know is, is for just one of us or for a couple, it's something that affects every single one of every single one of us. So when we organize, we must keep up the pressure, we must keep organizing and recognize that when we organize uh, in solidarity with one another, it's not about charity or sympathy, but it's about justice and liberation. And when we do fight, we are not just fighting for our individual liberation, but for our collective liberation too. Thank you so much, Adam. That was a beautifully poetic note to end on. And just, you know, I think with, with what Syed and Adam have both said, um, you know, throughout their their talks, the idea of solidarity here is one that it's exactly as you said, Adam. It's it's not a transaction, and it's to show support for one another and to really just prove that like you are not alone in this fight. I think a lot of this sense of solidarity comes about as well when we talk about, for instance, like mental health awareness. The the idea that you are not alone in this fight that you are facing and that you are in fact um, a lot more yeah present um and and that we're all in this together realistically um th thank you that was yes sorry it's left me with a lot to think about here um but we'll swiftly move on to um mariam um who is joining us from palestine um mariam Bar barguti sorry uh is from ramallah and she is a palestinian writer and commentator her writing has appeared in the new york times al jazeera english Huffington Post, Middle East Monitor, Mondo Vase, International Business Times, and more. So you know she's a credible source. Um, and yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing what um, Mariam has to say. So Mariam, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, 
first of all, thank you for having me here. And it's it's really been a pleasure to hear the stories um, from Adam and Sayed. And it's, it's really nice to also hear because I think uh, many of us or many of us that have kind of seen the, the uglier side, I suppose, of the uprisings um, in the time since 2011 are being geared towards this place of seeing the interconnectedness of it all. And I think because a lot of it um, was stimulated through social media, which is a global platform, so we were kind of seeing things unravel in real time. Um, and I think that reconceptualized solidarity for us um, and redefined it. And we're in the process of redefining it together. So it was really nice to hear everything because it, I just related uh, so much to what's being said. And I think that's really what solidarity is. It's relating um, without necessarily saying, I know exactly how you feel. Um, but saying, I know what this looks like. This looks like oppression. Um, and it's just another mask or another face and it's wrong. Uh, so I wanna really add uh, also on what Adam was saying in terms, do we really show conditional solidarity? Do we show solidarity um, because of uh, 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 being connected, for instance, through the tear gas? I know the tear gas that was used in Ferguson that was used um, during the, the Wall Street protests was the same uh, tear gas that was used here against us. Uh, uh, the same company, the same everything, but is that the reason to show solidarity? What if we're not connected at all? What if I can't relate? And that's where I, what I mean is we're reconceptualizing solidarity to look at the systems of oppression more. And I think we faltered into a mistake of trying to humanize each other um, to ourselves, to each other, and to the world. And by each other, I mean those of us who are undergoing these, these very difficult struggles um, and trying to come together. But in trying to humanize ourselves, we dehumanized ourselves. How many photos have you seen of protesters who just lost their eye or they're bleeding and gushing or the clouds of gas smoke? And how many of them can you tell apart? because I think they all look the same, that if you aren't told where this is, you will very easily think this is in your backyard. Um, and so we need to start highlighting these tactics that they're using against us because it's a system. And, and again, similar to what Adam was saying, oppression is thousands of years old. It didn't begin now. Um, and it is, it's, it's guided kind of by our ability to just see things as black and white as up or down in these binaries, right? So I know, and in, in from my activism, and I know from my time in Palestine, on the ground, and, and, and just, you know, when we're quote unquote intellectualizing <laughs> um, our activism, is I always thought that the, the quote unquote, the intellectuals aren't a part of mobilization. They're just sitting and they're just talking and they're just, um, turning simple ideas like community to some complex um, series and books and all of that. Uh, and it was only later on that I realized, no, that's their role. And that's what solidarity is. That's what they're good at. They're good at unpacking the realities um, as we live them. Uh, there are people like me who can go to the street, who can protest, who can take months on top of months and then years on top of years of tear gas inhalation that I have no idea what's wrong with my lungs already at this point. But my mother and father can't. Um, some people don't want to. My sister, when my sister came with me to a protest, I told her, sis, you have a son. <laughs> I'm this 21 year old um, woman. It's okay, let me risk it. But you have a son, go home. And I remember feeling so guilty because as if I was betraying the cause by telling a person to not protest, to not be on the street. But I also know my sister's role wasn't the street. That's not what she's good at. My sister's role for our struggle is her building an education system and that's what she's doing. Um, I think we mistake solidarity in that we have to say, I'm doing this because I'm in solidarity. No, you just do. You do solidarity is the act of getting uncomfortable. 
how many times have you walked past um, someone who is homeless or someone who is begging for money or resources and you just turned away? Not because you don't want to give, but because maybe you didn't have change that day, but you were so uncomfortable that it was better to turn away than to actually do something. How many times have you justified someone homeless being in the street? Oh, well, they're probably addicts, right? Or well, they're probably gonna go and buy some, some alcohol. Well, what if that's what keeps them warm at night? Um, I think I, I, I read this somewhere that there are studies where, you know, the alcohol helps actually keep your bodies warm. So it's this understanding also that if you wanna help someone, you don't make up the obstacles. You don't make up how that liberation should look for them, right? You have to be uncomfortable enough to know that your support doesn't mean your vision. It means theirs. And you helping other struggles reach that. And, and the, the, the reason I'm trying to also speak about the, from the perspective of being Palestinian, for instance, extending solidarity, is because I think we talked a lot about how we want to receive it. Um, and in the Palestinian case, I've seen that become an exceptionalization of Palestine, right? You've seen in many places the slogan that it is the last colonial reality here, but it's not. And I want to kind of close in on this, where it's so important um, to recognize our connectedness, but it's also important to recognize that that's not the reason um, we are trying to help each other out of these oppressive uh, systems. Thank you. Thank you. What do you mean, thank me? Thank you. That was incredible. Like, I. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the words. Sorry, BSL interpreters. This is probably not very easy to interpret. But no, I mean, I think you're entirely right. It's it's I often talk about um, the fact that it, the conversations surrounding BLM this summer have left people feeling uncomfortable because that has probably kickstarted some sort of growth that either they don't want to do or that they cannot do because they don't have the facilities or capacities to do it in that moment, um, whether it be mental or otherwise. So I think it's it's um, a really good point that you touched on here that solidarity, you know, as Adam also said, it's not transactional. It's something that you do because you you're there and you want to 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 be a part of not even necessarily a part of the fight, but um, show your support and that these people, no one is alone in their fights for for freedom. Um, and and thank you for highlighting the different roles as well that we play in, in in this fight for freedom. It not everyone can you know go down and 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 protest the uh, conventional way, shall we say? And something that we highlight at uh, education, demilitarized education, is specifically that this is a place for you to be able to be your best activist self, um, however best you see it fit for you. I hope that made sense. <laughs> um, but last but not least. We have our speaker from New York, Pascal Péon. I get to use my uh, French skills here in saying her name. She is a PhD candidate in African Diaspora Studies at SOAS University of London. She also works as a research as associate at McCann, a Palestinian-led educational nonprofit focused on Palestinian rights, freedom, justice, and equality. But before joining McCann, Pascal completed a Master of Science degree in Human Rights from the London School of Economics and Political Science. She has also presented and given lectures at Butler University, Imperial College London, Pacific Union College, and Jewish, Jewish Voice for Peace. And she has written for uh, Plus 972 Mag and Rights Mag. So Pascal, whenever you're ready, again, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll just go ahead and start with that. Um, so as a Haitian woman who was born and raised in the US, I've grown up with the knowledge that my ancestors fought against white supremacy, slavery, and colonization in one. So they created the first Black Republic and the only country to be founded on a successful slave revolt. So as the descendant of Haitian revolutionaries from both the Haitian Revolution and afterwards, I understand that my identity was only made possible through revolution and resistance and the unrelenting desire to live with dignity and freedom. So for me, fully understanding my own history 
means that I know that it's necessary to oppose all forms of oppression, including those based on white supremacy, capitalism, colonialism, and imperialism. And even though the details of my oppression and discrimination, both historically and currently, as a Black woman or as a Haitian or as a Black American, differ to the oppression that Palestinians face, I can still recognize that what Palestinians around the globe are experiencing and have experienced and what Black people around the globe are experiencing and have experienced are rooted in racism, colonization, and imperialism, and militarism. So in the US context, um, you know, obviously these things have harmed Black Americans but, and Indigenous people, but it also harms Black and non-Black people globally. So for example, the US has invaded, exploited, and occupied basically all of Latin America and the Caribbean at some point or currently um, in order to uphold right-wing US interests as well. And they've done the same in other regions around the world. Um, and in my home country of Haiti, the US is currently backing an authoritarian government. So it doesn't really make sense for me to see these different issues in the US and only oppose them in the US and not oppose them anywhere else. We have to recognize and oppose these issues wherever they appear. And um, you know, looking at racism and colonization in Palestine or the US, it becomes a sort of case study for how these evils manifest themselves. So these contexts show how colonization, capitalism, imperialism, and racism have sort of embodied themselves against Black populations and against Palestinians. And when we realize that these ideologies are the issues that are at hand, we're able to apply our stances and our beliefs to different contexts all around the world. And I think that's what makes internationalism so powerful because we're able to connect these struggles against the same evils in different situations and show solidarity based on that. So, um, and then also when you study the details of this oppression, you notice how linked our struggles are, not only in the ideologies, but also in the exact practices that are used to oppress us. So um, Curry Peterson Smith says in their essay in the book, Palestine, a Socialist Introduction, when entire societies, political and legal regimes are constructed over years to maintain the domination of a population, as is the case with these two in referring to the US and Israel, there's no such thing as coincidence. And that's the end of that quote. So some examples of this, since the 1990s and increasingly since 9-11, US law enforcement has been receiving training from Israel. So it's been the FBI, the police, immigration officials, just law enforcement in general. Um, and as of July, 2020, more than 1000 senior police officials from the US visited um, or had visited the um, Israel for training. So that doesn't mean that the US somehow learned police oppression, I mean, police brutality or oppression from Israel. But what it does mean is that two institutionally and historically racist states founded on things like oppression, theft, colonization, and in the US's case, enslavement, are swapping tactics and ideas with each other. And of course, this um, has a lot of negative effects. This supports the trend in increasingly militarized policing tactics with the line between the police and the military blurring even more. And we can see that just in these past few years. And um, especially it was really highlighted this past summer with the police essentially looking and behaving like the military. Um, so an example for this is um, where I'm based in New York City, the New York Police Department, they have a budget of $6 billion. And that's a larger budget than many militaries of countries around the world. And the former New York City Mayor, Michael Bloomberg, once bragged that he had his own army in the NYPD and that it was the seventh biggest army in the world. And this was in 2011 when the NYPD's budget was 4.6 billion. So, um, and they also have their own Navy, they have an office in Israel. So, you know, this is of course a highly, highly militarized police force. And this is increasing violence in both the US and in Palestine, Israel. Um, this also disproportionately harms communities of color in both contexts through dehumanization, control, violence, and the assumption that Black people in the US and Palestinians in Palestine, Israel are inherent threats and therefore justified targets of police of the police and military. Um, another way that our struggles are connected explicitly is through funding. So the US currently gives $3.8 billion to the Israeli military each year. And this is a clearly a very significant amount, but it's also more than the US gives any other military in the world. And since 1948, the US has given over $142 billion of US taxpayer dollars to the Israeli military. So what this means um, is that the bombs and the weapons used on Palestinians and their homes and their land are often directly from the US. And the other way around, it works like that as well because the weapons in the U uh, that the US uses around the world and on its own population during protests and demonstrations are often first tested on Palestinians. So these issues are very closely linked. 
And, um, you know, these are just a few ways that our struggles are directly connected, but there have been links of solidarity between Palestinians and Black people globally, but especially um, Black people in the U.S. So most Black revolutionaries came to support Palestine through a lens of decolonization and international solidarity. And they placed our struggle as Black Americans in that context as well. So it became easy to view other situations through that lens. So some examples of this, um, in 1959 and 1964, Malcolm X visited Palestine. And he later wrote about how the British helped steal Palestine from Palestinians and how the Palestinian cause is part of a larger anti-imperialist struggle. And a few years later in 1967, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee published a paper in solidarity with Palestine just two months after the 1967 war. And they later published papers in solidarity with South Africans against apartheid there and um, against the US invasion of Vietnam. So black liberation organizations were very intentionally internationalist. And in 1970, Huey Newton, one of the co-founders of the Black Panther Party issued a statement saying that Israel was created by Western imperialism and is maintained by Western firepower. We support the Palestinians just struggle for liberation 100%. We will go on doing this and we would like for all the progressive people of the world to join our ranks in order to make a world in which all people can live. And that's the end of that quote. So later Huey Newton went on to meet Yasser Arafat who is the chair of the Palestinian Liberation Organization also known as the PLO at that time. And he visited a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. And at one point the Black Panther Party was in daily contact with the PLO um, and they also met Palestinian delegates during the first Pan-African Cultural Festival in 1969 in Algeria. And um, the PLO was also inspired by the Black Panther Party by creating a 10-point program um, stating their demands for justice, which was based on the Black Panther Party's 10-point program as well. And Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish also compared racism in the US and Israeli context. So there's definitely been a lot of close links of solidarity throughout the years between Palestinians and Black Americans, and people like James Baldwin, Angela Davis, Muhammad Ali, Mark Lamont Hill, Michelle Alexander, and so many others have voiced their support for Palestinian liberation. Um, all of these people have understood that very deeply that the Black struggle and the Palestinian struggle are both part of a greater struggle for freedom for all oppressed people. And even today, there's many Black liberation organizations that still stand in solidarity with Palestine. Um, the Dream Defenders, which was created as a response to the murder of Trayvon Martin, they organized a delegation to Palestine um, with Black activists from the U.S. in 2015, and they went alongside with the Black Youth, the Black, the Black Youth Project, sorry, 100, and um, activists from Ferguson, Missouri, where Mike Brown was murdered by the police a year before. Um, and Black Lives Matter as an organization and the larger organization, the Movement for Black Lives, um, have both voiced their continued support for Palestinian liberation. So um, this support also is coming from Palestine to the US um, in solidarity with black people. So as a response to the latest wave of police murdering black people in the US and the uprisings that followed that this past summer, Palestinian organizations such as Al Auda and the BDS National Committee released formal statements in support of Black Lives Matter, the Movement for Black Lives and other black led organizations that work toward black liberation. Um, and even you know, black people outside of the US have also supported Palestine in their struggle for liberation. So Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela, they've both voiced um, in the past, they both had voiced their support for Palestine multiple times with Nelson Mandela stating how the freedom of South Africans would be incomplete without the freedom of Palestinians. And in Australia, Aboriginal activists and academics along with Palestinian Australians um, have hosted a black Palestinian solidarity conferences multiple times. And so again, you know, people have been making these very clear international links um, in opposing the evils of colonialism, imperialism and raci racism wherever they appear. And this is all just part of re recognizing that true freedom is only possible when we're all free. So coming from that background, and understanding that history, our movements become just so much stronger when we all stand together. And I always think that the ideal situation is that we can all stand up for each other's struggles and help one another and make a sort of like massive coalition together. But on top of that, standing in solidarity with others can also teach us about our own movements and inspire us to continue the struggle for freedom for all people. So it's, it's even though you know we do it for other people and we don't do it to get something back, but also our movements become strengthened by that too. Um, but I think that above all, we definitely need to care about each other as humans 
at the basic level. So um, like Huey Newton said, so we can make a world in which all people can live. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pascal. I mean, I, yeah, I could not agree more. I, especially with your Haitian roots, I'm sure that um, it, it must feel pretty, um, what's the word? Um, like you're definitely, you've definitely got the fire to keep the revolution going <laughs> and to put an end to the oppression. So um, yeah, I, 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 these were all incredible, incredible talks. And thank you so much um, for taking the time today to like speak to all of us, myself included about these links that I probably would have understood later, but like, I'm glad that it was brought up today. <laughs> um, but as we, you know, for those who are attending, um, please feel free, you know, to put uh, any questions that you have in the Q&A box, which you should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I'm going to start off this kind of Q&A session. Uh, I've got a, a question that is basically for all of the panelists here today. Um, and I guess it's, Perhaps this this could be a, a good yeah way to get the questions going um, from the um, attendees. But uh, and we'll go from the order of who spoke first. So we'll do Sayed and then Adam and then um, Miriam and then Pascal. But from your perspective, right? Uh, what is the biggest lesson that we have learned from the last ten years, and how can we apply them to our movements today? I know that solidarity is obviously a massive massive part of you know those those lessons um because clearly all of our fights are linked and <laughs> if if we support one another there's no way that we're going to go any lower but is there anything else on top of that that you can think of you know that um really struck as like a, a lesson um from from the last 10 years and then seeing the blm protests this summer you know it was, yeah so i'm gonna leave that question sayed uh, thank you so much. This is incredibly important a question. And I think it's about learning from each other lessons. And uh, that's, that's the key thing which I feel is extremely important. And how, how would you be able to understand this is by identifying the struggle. From, so for instance, one important exercise which we attempted to do when, when we looked into how Bahrain is focused on arresting children in 2021 February and the anniversary. I think it's not just about looking into showing solidarity alone, but it's also about understanding how the repression work, exposure then to identify who could change this issue. So the problem is of arresting children is not only a problem alone for Bahrain. We were able to identify what were the factors that could be crucial. So for instance, we were able to identify some children were arrested because they protested Formula One race. So then we brought it to be a problem to Formula One. Then there are another factor that that when when a question is written to the British government in Parliament or a, a member of Parliament raising the matter, then let's see how the British government is responding. So I think what we really need to do is to learn from each other lessons. It's not about just being ready to show solidarity by the way how we see it as mariam i think i really love the way how she expressed it it's about really attempting to learn from each other and whenever there is a place or a role we could play let's play that role and it's also like the last thing is about the strength of our location so if we if i'm based in london then i have my own strength if i'm based some my friend my cousin is based in somewhere else, they have their own strength. And we have to be ready for this. And so the most important is, let's understand what is our strength point and let's use it, let's focus on it because in that way we'll be far stronger, thank you. Thank you, Adam. Would you like to uh, give your two cents? Um, it's a question I've been thinking about uh, quite a lot recently, actually. Um, mm -hmm. What, what, what can we, and I guess it's in part because of the pandemic um, and having more time to reflect and think uh, on my own, this question of what are the lessons that we can learn from the past for the future? And you know, I, I, I remember an interview um, by uh, well, one of the Black Lives Matter organizers over in the States who was doing a TV interview um, um, in the run-up to the elections, um, 
And he said, when asked about, you know, Black Lives Matter um, in the States and its capacity to sort of um, be used to transform uh, and add further dimensions to ongoing struggles in, 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 in the States, uh, he said something that was quite poignant and has kind of stuck with me since, um, that when we uh, align with Black Lives Matter um, and, and the kind of principles that uh, underpin it, right? Mm. Uh, we unlock the potential uh, uh, for, for, all of, for all of us to get free. And he, he used this um, example of the way in which uh, BLM organizers were at the forefront of uh, sort of flipping the state of Georgia. Um, it was, it's, it's, it's a really incredible sort of case study when, when you look at how that happened against, uh, against all odds that happened. I and mean, that's not to kind of say that our efforts for liberation should be focused into electoral politics. That's not at all what I'm advocating. Um, it's not what I believe, but it's, a, it's, 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 on, uh, it's, it's without doubt that, um, you know, in some cases that can be of benefit to us. Now, the point that he made though, about when we align with those most oppressed and marginalized in society, that we unlock the potential for all of us to get free. It's something that runs at the heart of, uh, uh, the BLM uh, movement for me personally, because it forces into the conversation, um, you know, uh, not not just the like cis het black male, um, but we're thinking about uh, queer black people. We're thinking about um, trans black people. We're thinking about sex working black people. It's all black lives that matter, not just one category of persons um, in, uh, from, from amongst that. Now, if we're thinking about the most marginalized and the most oppressed society and we're aligning our struggles in a, and organizing it in a way that we're trying to get them free, by, by definition, all of us, you know, will, will, will experience greater freedoms, you know, we'll be one step closer to liberation for all of us. Um, and I think that's the lesson from the past 10 years, really, that when we really truly think about who is it that is facing the brunt of oppression in society today, and we try to organize in solidarity with them, by definition, all of us will be one step closer to freedom. And I think, yeah, that's the that's the lesson for me. No, I mean, yeah, thank you. That was such a great answer as well. You guys are also eloquent and like amazing with what you say and how you say it. Um, I'm very jealous. Miriam, the floor is yours. <laughs> Hi, yes. Um, I was looking at the questions in the chat box and they really are wonderful. Um, I think I'm still processing the lessons that I learned or have been learning um, from my experience in, in the Palestinian struggle and in solidarity with um, the struggles in the US and Bahrain. But what I'm gathering so far is that solidarity is also recognizing our imperfections you know just because a group is struggling doesn't mean they're perfect and you know higher than thou and they will not make mistakes so when once we recognize that about groups i think we can show up uh, a lot better um, than we are right now so i'm learning that solidarity means making mistakes but learning from them uh, one other thing that I learned from these past um, 10 years, this past decade, is don't follow the leader. Uh, I think one of the biggest uh, issues in repression is the soldiers, not the leaders, right? You can't have oppression unless you have the soldiers. You can't have a movement unless you have the soldiers. We never really know their names kind of thing. Um, we need to also know that we are soldiers just because we're not in the military gear, just because we don't have the um, technological weapons does not mean that. And we need to know to say no in our own movements as well, because solidarity like revolution, okay, is going against the grain. It is going against the unfamiliar. It is shaking things up. And, and, and these things have to stay with us as well, because I do think if I've seen anything, it's a lot of, um, pride
being nurtured, a lot of ego in solidarity movements, in struggles in general, of uh, starting to think, you know, we know more or we're invincible or all of that. So it, we need to, you know, a little humility will let us also see that the leaders aren't, um, you know, all knowing either, and they're not invincible either. And oppression isn't invincible. So bringing humility within our circles, I think will naturally just bring the monster back to its size and we can confront it better together. Um, and then the last thing I learned on a concrete level and it's building also on what Said was saying, solidarity is knowing your role. It is knowing what you're good at and it is knowing your position and using it. As a Palestinian, it is difficult to critique the Palestinian Authority, to critique Hamas, to critique Israel and say the word colonialism because I'm Palestinian. Mm. So those that can say that, do it. And that's why, for instance, with me and Syria, um, you know, those in Syria, those in Bahrain cannot be so vocal about the regimes they're critiquing. You heard say, say the nightmarish stories that is similar to Palestine with the kids um, being detained in the US, they're being put in cages. So my privilege is I can speak out against, for instance, Bashar al-Assad. Um, people in the US can speak out against Israel and not worry about being dragged out of bed in the middle of the night for it. So it's that's solidarity, it's proactive. It's not saying I'm in solidarity, it's being in solidarity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the hardest lesson for me, it's doing. Yeah, I mean, that. I think as always, you're entirely right in what you're saying and that like it's more than just you know saying that you recognize that you're in solidarity but more that you are taking the steps um that best fit you in order to to do that um and pascal yeah um sorry just to echo off of what mariam just said i think that's so important um for us to recognize that there are people that, you know, we may not be risking our lives or it may not be as uh, difficult for certain people to stand out. And unfortunately, because of how racism and heteronormativity and all of that, those oppressive systems work, you know, sometimes it will be those people who are not from those backgrounds who will be listened to more. Um, I think it is important to uplift the people's voices who are, of course, being like oppressed the most, but at the same time, like use your privilege for good. Um, you know, actually stand up for people. Um, but to answer your question, I feel like a big lesson that I've learned um, that can be definitely applied for today is just that, you know, together we're always stronger. Um, just going back to me being Haitian, in the, there's like a, a part of the Haitian flag, there's like a banner that says that unity, through unity makes strength. So that is something that um, was referred to in the Haitian Revolution in itself, because how else would a bunch of enslaved people without resources um, overtake one of the largest militaries in the world at that time? It's only through unity. There's, that's the only way you can do it. So I think that um, unity in our movements, that's so important. And I think that a lot of times too, we, we think of these leaders in our movements as these like one influential figure, like in the US, we always think, oh, like MLK or like Malcolm X, like they were the only people who could do it. And now that they're gone, nobody can do it. But um, Angela Davis actually says in one of her books, I forgot the name of it, but um, Angela Davis talks about how a lot of times these movements are kind of um, the, the, I guess the grassroots aspects of these movements are kind of erased in order to make it seem like it's just one person leading the movement. And then now that they're dead, the movements are over. And obviously, you know, the US would love for us to think that or any other oppressive, um, power would love for us to think that it's, it just takes one person but first of all nobody's that strong and powerful enough but also the the strength does come from numbers and it does come from being united not only within our own uh, movements but also within different movements around the world too so we see it as just a larger movement for liberation of everybody yeah i agree gosh i'm having such a wonderful time moderating this panel it's great um and you know i i think i completely agree with all of you there's there's numerous lessons to be learned that can are still to be learned and and we still have ways to go um and lessons to pick up on the way so you know 
as long as we're ever learning and thriving, that's the what we're looking for the most, I, I guess. Um, we have a question from the SANE Collective, S-A-N-E, um, and it's kind of in relation to the link that's just been posted in the chat box about an event tomorrow morning um, that looks at the intersecting issues uh, that exist within the global arms trade. So the question, which um, I'm guessing is for uh, all of the panelists, um, you know, does the movement for climate justice offer a chance to bring resistance against these multiple evils together to finally reclaim our world from the powers of oppression? Which I think is a, it's a good question. So I guess we can either go again in the same <laughs> uh, direction or if anyone wants to like, take the question, it's also up to you guys, but we can start with Sayed. Regrettably, I'm not too sure I would be the person to answer the question. It's, uh, I don't have a very clear answer to it, frankly, but again, the question on solidarity always, mm -hmm. uh, about, I mean, I don't know how about to start with someone else, and then if I, something come up in my mind, I would be clearer, uh, so. Mm -hmm. I guess this would be the best way forward. That's all good. Um, well, I guess we can go to Adam. Oh, can't hear you. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, I'm still getting the hang of this Zoom stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just wanted to thank the same collective for that brilliant question. It's an important question. Um, that of, you know, uh, climate justice and um, what it kind of introduced into the conversation. Um, I think without doubt, uh, you know, thinking about uh, uh, climate chaos, uh, climate injustice, um, and how it disproportionately affects frontline communities, um, which is a term that's used to refer to those in global south um, who are facing the brunt of uh, climate chaos. Um, the rising uh, sea levels don't affect us all. Uh, Equally, some uh, some 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 peoples are are uh, less equipped um, to deal with the changing climate, um, precisely because of the legacies of colonialism. And um, there's a there's a brilliant organisation called Wretched of the Earth um, that organised um, a block at the front of a demonstration that happened in London. Um, when the Paris climate talks were happening. Um, protests were at the time uh, banned in France due to the state of emergency. And so London being the uh, being a nearby sort of large city where people could uh, come and organize a protest uh, was the host city for the march and rest of the earth was leading the uh, sort of frontline communities in uh, this demonstration, right? And the slogan that they had was uh, CO2, um, but also colonialism with uh, the first part of colonialism written as CO2, um, linking the question of, uh, of race, of colonialism to that of the climate, uh, to that of climate justice. And I think we have to keep, you know, drawing out these kinds of links when we're thinking about uh, justice, uh, freedom, liberation. Um, so of course, for me, when I think of uh, climate justice, I know for a fact that it's something that amplifies all these other existing uh, uh, systems of oppression that happens. And it's just ex an acceleration of ongoing crises um, and structures of domination and oppression. So when we uh, think of, when we keep that in mind when uh, organizing our resistance uh, to it, we also know that we have to um, align ourselves with the frontline communities um, and listen to the demands that they've that they have. So for example, the, the world not listening to the demand for 1.5 degree warming um, as opposed to two degrees has led to sort of calamitous sort of uh, consequences for the world overall. Um, so frontline communities do offer us a lot in terms of wisdom and knowledge when it comes to organizing resistance to uh, climate injustice. I think that's kind of like a starting point for conversations that we should have about that. I, yeah, couldn't agree more, as always. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mariam, would you like to, do you have anything to add to this? Yes, yes, yes. I would really like to add to this. Um, so the thing, uh, I completely agree with everything Adam's saying. 
Uh, and I, I think, especially when it comes um, to, to environmentalism, that at least in the Palestinian context, and I don't want to generalize, uh, we tend to relegate it to a secondary issue or third issue because we know gender is the secondary issue here. <laughs> um, so th 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 there's a problem with that. And I'm really happy that we're seeing more um, care towards uh, environmentalist issues right now, because essentially what colonialism uh, did, if we want to go back historically, is that it killed our relationship with the land. Um, if you see it the way it happened in the Americas, if you see it in Palestine, it's, we constantly say uh, the word uprooting, that we are being uprooted uh, from our lands. Uh, and, I, and I think once we really look at what that meant is that we took care of the land because it fed us. And I think what's happening now is this, this reconciliation with our own limits as humans, because we cannot command um, you know, the natural sciences. And I think that the movements that we're witnessing now globally on, on really prioritizing this issue is gonna show, um, is gonna let us get uncomfortable with ourselves. And I think the fact that it's an even younger generation is making us all a lot more uncomfortable um, with ourselves. They're, they're using things like TikTok now to, to mobilize. I mean, come on, that is really intelligent. <laughs> um, and, and I think it's bringing back to the top the roots of all of our struggles, which is the resources that keep us alive so we can keep fighting each other, right? I, so I think it's going to make it bigger. Yeah, sorry. I could not. I could not agree more. I think what we also saw a lot with um, Extinction Rebellion here was that there was the the reminder that like a lot of indigenous populations have been, you know, advocating for um, for against. I'm not sure what the right word is here, but like climate change, and that we need to do something before it's way too late. And so. You know, I think, yeah, highlighting those issues specifically is entirely that I'm my mother's from um, Democratic Republic of Congo from the east, and we are currently being pillaged day after day after day by multinational corporations. And I don't know what that's going to do on the landscape of like how our environment heals after that. Um, but sorry, last but not least, Pascal, love your to hear your opinion on this. Yeah, so thank you for this question. I think it's really important, especially because militaries are the, you know, the US military is the largest polluter in the world and militaries in general are obviously terrible for the planet. They're not only terrible for people, which is, you know, we can all obviously see that very clearly, but they're terrible for the life of the planet. And, um, you know, there's no climate justice without justice in general. Like it, climate justice, I don't think um, exists in an unjust world. And I think we need to prioritize the rights of all life and not just certain lives. And that includes the life of the planet as well. Um, because capitalism, colonization and, pa and the patriarchy like mentioned in the question, those things are all things that devalue the planet and destroy the planet actively. Whenever, you know, like the Amazon, when, when it's being, like all the trees are being removed from the Amazon, it's for capitalist interests, you know? Um, when pipelines are being placed in um, the US or around the world in different places where people's water is being poisoned and the earth itself is being destroyed from that, those are capitalist interests. So a lot of times, and, and in the US also from capitalism and colonization, which are very closely linked. Um, yeah, so I think it's important to talk about the earth. And I think it's kind of one of those things that if you focus on one, you if you want to do it well, I think you kind of have to focus on the other. Like they, they are really one and the same, um, because you know when we better when we benefit from a better world, it includes the planet. So we have to remember that the planet itself is a living. Um, I don't know, being is the right word, but it's a living creature, I guess you could say. Um, mm -hmm. And there's no, it doesn't make sense for us to want justice for only human beings, and then you know all the animals and trees and <laughs> everything else dies because that then we would die too. So um, you know, essentially, yeah climate change, um, uh, sorry, <laughs> justice for the climate <laughs> includes justice uh, for everything else as well.
Yeah, no, I com this is how I end every thought in my head as well. So I'm the same. Um, you know, I think it is the fact that there is that uh, symbiotic relationship, right, between ourselves and our environment. We wouldn't be here if it weren't for our environment. And like, we need to take care of our environment. And we've not really been doing that for the last couple hundred years. So um, yeah, and intrinsically, intrinsically linked. Oh, I don't know if I said that right. Sorry, BSL interpreters. Um, I well, there's a question from Lane Diamond. I hope I said that correctly. I apologize if not, um, which is basically I'm going to direct it to Pascal and Adam. Um, how has how have your experiences in academia furthered, shaped or guided your path as an activist? I know that personally, when I did my master's in international law, I suddenly realized just how messed up everything is. <laughs> so that, yeah, please, Pascal, would you like to go first? Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, there's definitely some of the awareness that you get from studying these things where it, it's really easy to become just, you know, there's like not to lose all your hope about everything. But I think honestly, at the core of it, the reason why I am interested in the academic perspective is I think that it's important to combine a theoretical perspective with a practical perspective. I think theory on its own, um, like Mariam was saying, I think it can be helpful because I think that some people's movements, um, like calling, I guess you could say, in um, in solidarity or in, in, in the movements around the world. But at the same time, I think that it's a bit uh, dead, I guess you could say, if it's just theory and if it just stays within academia and even within academia, um, so much is just written for other academics. I think we need to worry about making um, a lot of the, um, the texts and writings and everything like that. We need to make it a lot more accessible so I think that's a huge issue right now um, and always has been with academia and it's very intentional. It's always been an issue that it's not accessible at all. There's like, I struggle reading so many like different texts that are so important. And I'm not saying that I'm like, you know, the, the standard of intelligence, but if, I, if I'm a PhD student struggling with it, how are we expecting to, to disseminate this information to just the average person walking around? So I think that that's a huge issue with academia in general, but um, yeah. And, and, I would say as a whole, it, I think the knowledge behind it goes together with the activism. And I think that education can be so powerful and so strong when used right and when it's accessible and when we combine that with action-based um, movement and action. Yeah, I agreed entirely. Um, Adam? Um, for me, I, um, <laughs> I, I ended up in peace studies by a total fluke and accident. I, uh, my mind boggles every time I think about it, actually. I started in the School of Pharmacy at my university before I transferred uh, to that particular uh, programme. Um, and when I think about why it is that I did that, in part due to my exposure to radical politics in, uh, in the couple of years prior to when I did make that shift, right, the anti-freeze movement, um, but also, you know, things uh, sort of Preceding that, um, the Iraq War, the War on Terror, uh, my own experience, my own personal experiences of like racism, um, growing up and uh, what have you. But also, um, you know, in in exploring sort of like the field of peace studies and uh, at Bradford, uh, peace studies was sort of set up by a man called Adam Curl. Uh, and he kind of, when he was he in his inaugural address, I'm sort of just pulling up. Um, the speech that he gave, he uh, defined sort of peace and peaceful relationships as those in which individuals or groups are unable to achieve together goals which they cannot have, uh, reach separately. So the program was kind of like from 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 the outset something that came out of like political movements, the peace movement um, of, uh, of of the uh, 60s, 70s um, is what it kind of came out of, right? And so it resonated with me because it sort of defines peace in the positive. So the presence of something and not the absence of another. And this is the kind of peace that I was interested in studying, um, the peace of which um, uh, the Reverend uh, Dr. King um, said that without it, there cannot be justice. And without justice, that same peace cannot exist. Um, the peace that was struggled for by uh, many uh, in their revolt against colonization during their uh, struggles for independence, sometimes through nonviolent means and other times not. Um, so it's, 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 it's something that I uh, sort of found myself exploring more, the philosophical question uh, associated with it, but also, you know, it deepened my understanding of uh, uh, 
how the world is structured and organized. Um, um, but at the same time, um, most of my learning uh, around politics did not come from this program. It came from the streets. That's where I received my true education um, in, in politics and in organizing, in knowing how to struggle for a better life, not just for myself and, and stand up for myself, but stand up for those uh, uh, around me and, and elsewhere. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest um, uh, thing for me when I think about, um, you know, where is it that my politics were, were shaped? Um, and I got to practice my, uh, my skills in organizing for the kind of politics I wish to see uh, sort of come to fruition in the world around me. Mm. It's, it's movements that give us this education. Uh, universities are unable and ill-equipped to do so. Um, not least because they are um, inherently oppressive institutions that seek to kind of centralize systems of knowledge production and dismiss um, alternative uh, sites of knowledge production. Um, and I think, you know, it, all of us were here today because we ha have an interest in, uh, in social change. We're interested in um, historical moments that have, uh, from which move movements have sprung out of um, or we might ourselves be today engaged in struggles. And if you're not, I'd encourage you to get involved in um, any kind of uh, political movement um, that might be happening in your in your vicinity, uh, or even like a mutual aid group um, during this like COVID pandemic. Um, that might be a good starting point for you to then find out some of the issues that are happening in your locality. But yeah, for me, definitely university helped me to deepen my understanding, or in some cases um, gave me the the language for the kind of politics that were already there um, but it doesn't really it didn't really do anything in terms of like pushing that politics further it just exposed me to more people who are saying the same thing in different ways I suppose it's an echo chamber you know <laughs> it's like you get lost in it and um, it's comforting but it's definitely one where it's the same uh, ideas that are just um, said over and over again in, in that, that's not to dismiss university though i mean they, they, they can and the university education can definitely be great and um there's a uh there's a great uh like there's a rich history of uh radical uh academia and i think that's something that i, I draw great inspiration from but yeah i was just, just to kind of say that that's not the be all and end all of it all um and oftentimes uh alternative sites of knowledge production uh are dismissed and i think i wanted to just uplift those for sure. I think that's that's the point is that you've mentioned you've said how you had kind of two sets of education. Right. And that's ultimately, hopefully, how one can really have a, a well-rounded knowledge of um, of a particular issue. Um, but thank you for your answer. And we are running out of time, unfortunately, because I know we could be here all night, <laughs> probably um, to be discussing these things because they are so near and dear to our hearts. Um, but before I kind of give the uh, closing moments, uh, I want to hear from all of our panelists. And I'm going to ask you a question that has been submitted anonymously and is frankly quite um, innocent and almost cute, I want to say. And I think that that's a really, really good way to end um, today's panel with a bit of hope. Um, so in the order with which we kind of conducted the panel tonight, could you please answer the question, you know, from your perspective, what does freedom look like? Sayed, I'll, I'll have you start. Well, if freedom is something that you probably will fight your entire life to get and you probably will not get because, because it's an ongoing struggle. Even if say what we learn from the Arab Spring, even if the Tunisian were able to table the system, then they, there will be so many new challenges they have to adapt into. And it's, it's, it's one layer to another. So it's, it's, the, there is a bigger problem. The moment you see it so clearly, if it is dictatorship, when you end it, then so many other issues will start. And so it's, it's just something that don't take the assumption that the freedom is something even if you get it, it will be there forever. It will be under a threat. You need to protect it. You need to ensure that that yeah, you do whatever it takes to save it. So it's ongoing struggle, and you probably live your entire life that you will not get it. So I think what to bring Obama to to power is the struggle before. So if Martin Luther King was not there. 
to fight at, at some point. Maybe it was, it looks like even helpless. You don't know what people would feel like about change, but it's because of them, then that change could happen after decades or whatever. So being a principal, doing the right thing at the right time is so powerful. It may not change anything, but good act of, a uh, uh, good act of goodwill always will trigger another, and I think it's 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 important to see. And I I hope that that this is how people will live in. Even if we are unable to create the change, there will be generations who will follow. And I saw it in the children generation, like those who were two years old when the revolution started. Now they are in the front for uh, front line to challenge the police the police brutality, and and a lot of them they did it with enjoyment. I wanted to end it with a stating. I think one of the funniest interviews I have with someone, I spoke to a child who was 13 as well, which was also subjected to abuse by the police. So I said to him, why do you feel that you were out here? It's because he said to me, because I'm on social media. Do you believe me? Like I was on TikTok. And when he said I'm on TikTok, he was just laughing and smiling. I could see how proud he was that he was on social media platform once he was enjoying. And I just wanted to end this by saying thank you so much for having me. It's been a great privilege and honor to be with you today. Thank you. It's been great to hear you speak, Syed, honestly. Um, and just thank you for, yeah, being a part of, of this evening. Adam, I'm gonna shoot the question to you now. Shoot, no pun intended, my God. Um. <laughs> uh, I was about to respond with uh, hands up. But... <laughs> <laughs> um, what does freedom look like to me? Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give such a cop out answer, um, <laughs> and and I, I I wanna reply with the with the title of a book by Angela Davis that freedom is a constant struggle. Uh, sometimes it's also not about having a good answer. Uh, rather, the asking of good questions is what I feel gets us closer to conceptualizing frameworks for achieving liberation and freedom for us all. It's kind of uh, Socratic in nature. Um, I revisited a, a text recently um, uh, that a writer and academic that I greatly admire, Graham Chester, as he con uh, contributed to. Um, the book is called um, We Are Everywhere, The Irresistible Rise of Global Anti-Capitalism. I'll just read it one more time, just in case people want to uh, look it up. Um, you can get a free PDF online. It's called We Are Everywhere, The Irresistible Rise of Global Anti-Capitalism. Um, and in the closing chapter, Walking While We Ask Questions, they kind of stated um, about this idea of asking questions, uh, not just of ourselves, but also of the movement, the world, and what have you. Um, they, they, they said in, in that closing chapter, when a movement stops asking questions of itself, the world, it becomes orthodoxy, an idea that has run out of ideas. It becomes fixed, static, brittle, rather than fluid. Water can resist the most savage of blows. Ice shatters. It is only armed with our questions that we can change history. And so going off from that, um, you know, this idea that by asking questions constantly of ourselves, uh, of the movements that we're engaged in, of the world, uh, we allow ourselves to remain fluid, to uh, be reactive and to respond to the challenges that come um, as time continues. I think that's um, uh, probably uh, the, the one thing that I would like people to, 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 to think about from me, if you uh, just uh, think back to anything that I said, uh, constantly ask questions, be inquisitive um, and ask difficult questions, not just uh, 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 of, of, of the movements that you're engaged in, but of power and people who hold power, ask them really difficult questions and, and hold them to account, um, challenge them uh, when you can. Uh, and remain reflexive in your approach to organizing. Beautifully put. Yes. Apologize for that really horrible not joke that I said earlier. Gosh. Um, yes. but, <laughs> um, but Mariam, I would love to hear from you as well, because you are very much on the front lines of an uh, ongoing fight for freedom. Um, I think the Palestinians are kind of on their fight to liberation. The freedom is a larger, bigger struggle, I think that's bigger than us. Um, but what does freedom mean to you? I think it's one of the most difficult questions. 
And the fact that we all struggle in answering it is maybe part of the reason of why we haven't achieved it yet, mm -hmm. um, because we still don't know um, what that real vision is. But for me, freedom um, is the ability to grow um, and not necessarily have to be supported, but at least not beaten down um, at every corner because I don't meet a criteria. Um, freedom is the right to choose to make mistakes um, if it means another reality. So I, I think that's what freedom is for me. Um, but I, I reserve the right to change that in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it is that the, the freedom to be able to make mistakes and to learn from them and to not the space to grow really like as individuals that's that's freedom and to exist as we are that's that's also freedom um thank you for that answer and last but certainly not least pascal um my haitian sister <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so honestly the first thing that comes to mind when i think of what freedom is or what it means to me um i actually saw uh a tweet actually <laughs> the other day um that was saying how it, it's wild to imagine that you know we're just like on this rock where we have everything we need there's no need for so war or anything yeah. and you know we're, we're out here like paying bills like yeah. existing colonialism you know like everything is completely man-made and i feel like um to me that just kind of puts an idea in my mind of like just to have that life without any like to have all that we need i feel like that to me would, would be what freedom is and also there's this poem that i really love by aurora levens morales and part of the, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you should definitely look it up. It's on her website, auroralevensmoralis.com. I'll add it to the chat. But um, part of the poem says, thus spoke the, po the prophet Roque Dalton. Altogether, they have more life, more death than we, but altogether, we have more life than they. There is more bloody death in their hands than we could ever wield, unless we lay down our souls to become them. And then we will lose everything. So instead, imagine winning. This is your sacred task. This is your power. Imagine every detail of winning, the exact smell of the summer streets in which no one has been shot, the muscles you have never unclenched from worry, gone soft as a newborn skin, the sparkling taste of food when we know that no one on earth is hungry, that the beggars are fed, that the old man under the bridge and the woman wrapping herself in thin sheets in the back seat of a car, and the children who suck on stones, nest under a flock of roofs that keep multiplying their shelter. Lean with all your being towards that day when the poor of the world shake down a rain of good fortune out of the heavy clouds and justice rolls down like water. Um, so she like goes on to kind of describe how we're like we are to imagine a world, the world that we want. We need to like literally imagine it. I'm I'm such a naturally optimistic and like imaginative person. So I guess to me that's kind of easier to do. And I know it is very depressing to look around and it doesn't seem close or at all, but like even if even in a practical sense when you're trying to create something you need to imagine it first you need to have a plan for it so i think that um you know we we do need to sit with that question and, and ask ourselves what does freedom look like you know mm -hmm. like freedom like adam was saying freedom is for everybody if it's not for the 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 people that society has rejected the most then it can't be for anybody else but mm -hmm. i think yeah freedom is when we all have what we need and there's no such thing as oppression anymore beautiful that was Incredible.